वसुदेवसुत देव कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गुरु In the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, the subject of karma yoga has started. Sri Krishna has taught jnana yoga, the nature of the self, that I am the absolute existence, consciousness, bliss. This has been taught, and as a means to the realization of that absolute, karma yoga has now been introduced. We were on verse forty. We had done number, verse forty. And now forty-one. Uh, Sri Krishna is making a case for karma yoga. What is the necessity of this practice? What is the practice he is going to start? We know in general what he is going to talk about: how to spiritualize our actions, and how do you do that? We also know that uh, what the advice would be to connect it to God instead of um, thinking that the primary motive being our own uh, selfish. Uh, fulfillment of our own selfish desires i am doing this action as a worship of god this is going to be the attitude for a karma yogi so that's what he's going to teach do an action for uh, as a worship of god if you are a devotee uh, though it the same thing can be done as um, uh, I, i am doing this selflessly for the welfare of others without bring even bringing god into the equation so people might ask that If I don't believe in God, uh, so can I do karma yoga? Yes, you can. That's also possible. And Sri Krishna talks about that also. But I don't believe in God is is not to my credit. <laughs> so if you if you have some kind of faith in God, it's good. You can put that to use. Connect it to karma yoga. Do your actions as a worship of God. And the second aspect of karma yoga is that. Um, without a desire for what is called the fruits of action um that means i am not doing it for what i'll get out of it though once i perform the actions the fruits will come the results will come of themselves uh, but i'm not doing it primarily for that anymore earlier i was doing it primarily for that but now i'm doing it primarily as as a spiritual practice and of course the results will come yes Krishna said that um, now I'm going to tell you about karma yoga. Right? Is karma yoga something new that he introduced, or was it there? Like we know, the Upanishads is full of jnana and, and, and the immortal knowledge of the immortal Atman. So, is karma yoga something new, or something that he is re-emphasizing? Because in chapter four he said, "I taught this to Vaivasan, and Vaivasan taught, and it's so parampara it came down, and now I'm." Teaching it back to you because it was lost. Yes. So, is it something new that he's resurrecting, or? In fact, in Vedanta, we say there is almost nothing new. <laughs> so, the roots of everything that is taught down to the to the present age, the seed of that, the roots of that, they all run back to the uh, Vedas, to the Upanishads. You can trace it back, but definitely, Sri Krishna's teaching of Karma Yoga in the Bhagavad Gita was a turning point. Uh, it was a major contribution. So the contribution is where he emphasized it, and the methodology, and the way he taught it, and what great importance he gave to it. So that's where Sri uh, Sri Krishna's uh, uh, genuine contribution, N- new approach is there. Sri Krishna was the great teacher of karma thousands of years ago, and in this age, it's Swami Vivekananda who again re- re-emphasized that. How do you spiritualize your your daily life? Yes. karma yoga as a as a means to uh means to what did i mention the structure of sadhana once here last time yes, the, you gave the three 
the, the matrix? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. This is what he's referring to. So you can, with, if you keep the matrix in mind, you can understand these comments. This comment is a, a, according to Shankara's thinking, Adi Shankaracharya's thinking. The a matrix is, you, you've got it written down somewhere. Yes. The problem, the solution, and the method. Yes. If you see the problem, solution, and method. Notice the um, teaching of, of Sankhya, that means the teaching of the nature of the self, was that you are Brahman, you are the absolute. That should solve the problem. If I am existence consciousness bliss, what problem actually remains? If, if I'm really convinced about that, if, if it's clear to me. But the problem is it's not at all clear to me. I don't realize it at all. Uh, the problem is agyana, uh, ignorance. Then uh, the method is jnana yoga. Shravana, manana, nidhid, dhyasana. Listen to it, uh, study it, uh, engage with it, reasoning and meditate upon it till it becomes clear. That's not working. Then... What is the problem? That the mind is scattered, the mind is impure. That is what the commentator is talking about. If the mind is scattered and impure, what will happen at that stage is, I am hearing about it, I am reasoning, I am asking the questions, I am memorizing the verses. I am even trying to meditate after it, after, uh, after a fashion. But it remains, um, it's not a direct living realization. That's what's called paroksha. Paroksha means beyond direct experience uh, it remains as something that i have read i've heard and i feel i have pe at this stage people will say i understand intellectually but ah then the Im immediately the teacher knows the nature of the problem <laughs> this is where the problem lies yeah. i understand intellectually but then krishna says all right verse 39 let's start <laughs> i understand the problem the remedy is here and that's true for most of us, almost all of us. Vivekananda, he says, <laughs> you can imagine his chuckle when he says that, I know where the shoe pinches. <laughs> so we come down to um, our daily life, our life as we are leading it. Arjuna's life, our life, what we are doing in life. How do you spiritualize that? There is a need for that. What is the need? The need is that without that, enlightenment is not possible. For most of us. But theoretically you must leave a little um, option for, their, for the rare few who don't need all this. Vedanta will of course say that such people have already done karma yoga in their past lives. So they are equipped for enlightenment, direct enlightenment in the, those fortunate few. But otherwise most of us we have to go through a graded course of spiritual practice. And that starts here. Um, so he's making a case for karma yoga. What, why is it necessary? 41st verse. Vyavasayatmika buddhi Vyavasayatmika buddhi Ekeha kurunandana Ekeha kurunandana Bahushakha yanantascha Bahushakha yanantascha Buddhya Vyavasayinam Buddha Yobhyavasayinam So he says to Arjuna, in this there is a single one-pointed determination. The thoughts of the irresolute are many branched and infinite. So the first argu argument for spiritual practice, Karma Yoga here he means the entire range of spiritual practice, including of course transformation of our work into spiritual practice. All kinds of spiritual practice have for the first, most important argument for that is one word, focus. Focus. The word he has used here is a technical term, Vyavasayatmika Buddhi. Vyavasayatmika Buddhi means um, one-pointed clarity, conviction about spiritual life. One might have clarity about many things. I am clear that I want to be a millionaire. I am clear I want to be the next Hollywood star. So that's the kind of clarity. And, and, and it helps. If you are really clear about something, you clear the decks for action. But here he means uh, clarity about spiritual life. So what, what is this clarity? A one-pointed clarity about spiritual life. My goal in life is enlightenment. 
Doesn't mean that I have to become a monk or something like that. I might or I might not. But ultimately my, my purpose in life is enlightenment, God realization. This is real. This is worthwhile. This is what I'm going to pursue. This is the highest thing open to me. This is the noblest endeavor uh, of, of uh, uh, human civilization. This search for spiritual enlightenment. If I am a seeker, and we all are, you wouldn't be here otherwise. You wouldn't even think of yourself as a seeker, but you are. There's a whole range. There's a spectrum, depending on intensity and how uh, advanced we are. But we are all speakers. Uh, we are all seekers. We are all seekers. I remember as a young monk, as a novice, I used to ask lots of questions. So those who have questions, never <laughs> don't feel bad. And one day I asked... Uh, this Swami, the monk in charge of the, uh, the abbot of the monastery. Um, Swami, I bother you with so many questions. Uh, don't you feel, I mean, from your point of view, isn't it irritating? You must have heard these questions so many times and so many, you know, you've been a monk for more than 50 years now. So, um, you know, his answer was illuminating. He said, no, why should I get irritated? We are all walking on the same path. That's a very interesting thing. We are all doing the same thing. We are, we are researching the same, uh, we are in the same project together. So why should I get irritated? You are talking about what I am interested in. He didn't say all these things. He just said, no, why should I get irritated? We are all walking in the same path. Um, so that one pointed conviction, my aim is God realization. My aim is nirvana, moksha, salvation, whatever you call it. Interestingly enough, Vedanta would say that is our aim whether you say it or not. Even the man who's trying to make a million bucks on Wall Street, even the person who is um, a, a drug addict, or who is, uh, um, or just your common man on the street just trying to do muddle the, his way through life, um, doing his or her best in life. All of us, whatever we are doing, no matter how confused, no matter how deter determined in life, no matter how materialistic or spiritual, we are trying to find fulfillment, happiness in the best way that we can. This primal urge, overcoming suffering and finding satisfaction, fulfillment, happiness, this is the goal. Now there is a wise way of doing it, which is spirituality. That is the claim of all the religions of the world. There's a wise way of doing it. And there's another wise way of doing it. Which is what the rest of humanity is doing. <laughs> now what Sri Krishna is saying. Karma Yoga starts with first step is. Declare it at least to yourself. I am a spiritual seeker. Yeah I am. No not like that. Not one of the ten things to do. Pick up the milk and uh, re remember to reply to emails and um, do a little bit of Vedanta. Not like that. I, I am primarily a spiritual seeker. That's my definition. That's how I define myself. So um, the commentary, the one I'm holding here is Sridhar Swami's commentary, uh, commentary. The commentators put a very beautiful spin on this. So Sridhar Swami, he gives a devotional approach to it. What is Vyavasaya Atmika Buddhi? One-pointed conviction, uh, clarity about spiritual life in terms of devotion. Beautiful thing he has said here. Vyavasaya Atmika, this, this term means Parameshwara Bhaktya Eva Dhruvam Tarishyami Iti Nishchaya Atmika Eva Eka Nishchaya Eva Buddhi Bhavati What a simple Sanskrit? By the grace of Bhagavan, Parameshwara, by the grace of the Lord, by the grace of God, I shall certainly cross the ocean of transmigratory uh, existence. I shall certainly get freedom, liberation, moksha, salvation. Certainly this will happen. This, he says, one-pointed conviction, clarity. This is what is meant by Vyavasayat Mika Bhutti. My goal is liberation and I... And my support is the grace of God. God is my support. And nothing else. So this kind of clearing of the decks for action in my life. Does this not mean that I'll become a monk or something? Sounds like that. Not necessarily. Oh, Arjuna continued to be a warrior. 
So this message has been received by people across the ages and they continue to do what they're doing, but their entire um, orientation about why they are doing what they are doing is changed. changed. And it also makes it very clear. Once you have a high goal in life, a clear goal in life, decision making also becomes very clear. Should I do this or should I not do it? Should I go there? Should I meet this person? This is what I want to do in life. All those things become very clear once you have a clear purpose in life. In any field, anybody who has done anything great, they have this overwhelming concentration of effort. Somebody said beautifully, um, whether it is Einstein or whether it is the Buddha or whoever it is, and I, we all have this one thing in common. We all have 24 hours in a day. The difference between me and them is what they did with those 24 hours in a day. And generally people who have achieved something great in life, uh, they do that one thing most of the time. Even in management science, they tell us that 80% of the results come from, the 80-20 rule, 80% of the results come from 20% of our work. Of all the things that we do, it's just 20%, one-fifth of our activities which give 80% of the results in our life. That means the rest of the activities is, uh, um, I won't say wasteful, but not really productive. And so you should con concentrate on that part of your life which is most closely connected to your goal in life, your purpose in life. So that's the, that's the advantage of having a great uh, purpose, overwhelming purpose in life. And here you don't have to ask what should be my purpose in life. We're telling you. <laughs> God realization, uh, however you understand it, moksha, liberation. And uh, you are in very good company. Whether it is uh, uh, Buddha or Krishna or Christ, you're in good company. <laughs> so... This is the, in fact, the wisest recommendation of all civilizations across time. That the highest thing that you can aspire for is spiritual liberation. How it has been understood different, depends uh, on the, the religions and on the philosophies. In fact, Swami Vivekananda would say, um, have, a, have a goal, have a high goal in life. And he would say, um, it should be your, no, your own highest goal. No, notice the words, your own highest. So, whose goal is it? It's mine. Like the Buddha said, do something not because you have been told, believe it not because you have been told to believe it, not because you have read it that it is so, not because your elders have said it, because you have examined it and found it to be true and good. You found something to be true and good. Therefore, believe in it. Therefore, uh, practice it in your lives. So it should be your own. Listen to everybody. Attend all the classes. Read all the books. But it should be something that you, you own it yourself. You feel that um, I want this from your heart. Um, and then the question would be that I have uh, so many things that I, I feel are my own. Uh, that I, I like so which one? Teenagers often say, there are many things that I like. I watch it on TV, I want to be like this person or that person, I want to do this. Or all of those things appeal to me, especially when you are young, many things appeal to you. So Swami so Vivekananda says, the highest among each of them. Uh, whatever your heart says, I want these things, examine them and see which is the noblest, which is the highest. Often the highest or noblest would mean Something that is of great good to you and all to everybody else. Often it, it is something that is um, extolled, uh, praised greatly in our civilization. So, your own highest goal. We used to tell students in, um, back in India that you should have a goal in your life. And I remember the way I would tell it to them is, there would be students and there would be monks present. I would say, Look, if I asked you, what is your goal in life? I'm sure, I'm sure you can give a lecture on what should be our goal in life, but what is your goal in life right now if I ask you? Most of you will sort of scratch your heads. Um, nothing specific. I mean, I have my day-to-day -day targets to do to-do list, but um, overall, I don't know. Just make it through, I guess, from day to day. You, most of you would say that. And then I would point to the 
monks and the novices would be sitting there and said, if you ask these people who are wearing the uh, orange robe or the white of the novices, if you ask them from the, from the youngest novice to the senior most monk, if you ask them this one question, what is your goal in life? All of them will immediately say, yes, we have a goal in life and it is realization of God. In our order, the goal is uh, for your own liberation and for the welfare of the world. For uh, enlightenment, freedom, salvation, whatever you call it, and for the good of the world. Now that that's what this dress stands for. I have a spiritual goal. That's the declaration. That's what the dress stands for. And this is what Krishna says. You don't have to put on a fancy uh, dress. Somebody asked me. I think it was in Hollywood. It was in Hollywood. I was walking down Hollywood Boulevard towards the library, and somebody said. Uh, why are you wearing an orange bed sheet or something like that? <laughs> no, it was, it was somewhere, not in Hollywood. In Hollywood, somebody stopped me and said, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to put on an orange bed sheet. Bed sheet. But um, as the saying in India goes, you have to color your mind orange. That means man rangaya. That, there's a saying in India. That, oh yogi, what a mistake you have made. You have colored your cloth but not your mind. That means, yogi, you have, you have put on the cloth of a monk, but you haven't made your mind the monk of a, of a monk. So, you have invited, made a great mistake. <laughs> so, we sh- uh, our, the, here Sri Krishna says, the mind of a spiritual seeker, vyavasai atmika buddhi, one-pointed clarity, conviction, I am a spiritual seeker and that's my goal. So my success and failure, will be, I will measure according to that. There's an old saying in India. A rainy day is not a bad day. It, it's, a, it's, it's an unfortunate day when I forget to take the name of Hari. When I forget to take the name of God. That's the unfortunate day. A rainy day is not an unfortunate day. It's coming tomorrow, snowy day. Huh? Okay, one more point here. Um, He says, those whose minds are not one-pointed, their minds are multi-pronged. They have multiple desires and they run after those desires. So, bahushakha, their minds are divided into multiple streams and the energies flow out year after year. Life goes by like that. Um, Giving up these multiple projects in life. You'll still do something. You'll have a job. You'll take care of it. Do your duties. Definitely. Like Arjuna is being asked to do his duty. But seeking for, seeking for fulfillment in the world. From the world. Going about the world with a begging bowl. Give me happiness. A couple of words of praise. A little success. A little, a little happiness there. A little pleasure there. Going around with a begging bowl to the world. That should stop. Giving up this project of finding happiness in sense pleasures. So there is an interesting point here. Notice how the spiritual disciplines, the five uh, fundamental practices in Vedanta, and similarly it's in yoga also. Um, Ahimsa, Brahmacharya, Satya, Asteya, Aparigraha. Non-violence, self-control, especially control of lust, truth, um, non-stealing, non-acceptance of gifts. So these are practices for a yogi. But consider how giving up these these, uh, negativities, all of them have the same form. What I mean is this, One, one teacher pointed this out. All spiritual practices have the same effect, peace, serenity, quietude, calmness, peace. What I mean by that is this, violence, anger, it can have many forms. Depending on whether you're irritated with your neighbor, irritated at, or angry with politics, uh, or um, 
um, uh, uh, furious at yourself, uh, or angry with the kids. It could be mm, of many, many, many forms. Many forms, many textures, anger, irritation, fury. But giving up anger, giving up violence in thought, word and deed is of only one form, that is peace. Do you see what I mean? The actually doing that in life, that means uh, uh, giving uh, free expression to anger and violence can take many forms. Anger and violence can take many forms. Angry thought, angry word, and depending on the person you're angry with, the situation you're angry with, many, many, many endless forms. What he says, bahushaka, divided into many forms. But giving up anger and violence, that give ahimsa, practice of non-violence, it is only one form, peace. Sense pleasures, of many types, depending on the sense objects. There's a, a desire for a cookie, for a, for a movie, for the company of a friend, for uh, all kinds, so many objects of pleasure in the world. And as many objects of pleasure, so many different types of enjoyment and desires. So desires are multiple for sense pleasure. But the practice of brahmacharya, giving up, letting go of that, is of one nature only, peace, shanti. Similarly, truth, falsity is of many types. They say truth is one, the lies are many. Or Chesterton put it very beautifully. He said, there's only one way to stand up straight. There are many ways to fall down. <laughs> lies are many. And as we, if, if I tell lies, the, the uneasiness, anxiety, the complications in my life will be of various sorts. Endlessly multiplying. Various sorts. But giving up lies is of one sort only. Peace. You see where I am going with this? All the vices are of multiple sorts. All passions and worldly desires are of, of, of an enormous multiplicity. But giving them up. Why giving them up? Why? Because I, I, it's not no longer. I don't think that I am going to get permanent satisfaction or joy in them. That's no longer my primary pursuit. So giving that up, Sanskrit tyaga, is of one type only, peace. That peace and this one-pointed uh, desire for God-realization, the one-pointed pursuit of spirituality, they go together. Without that peace, th this uh, one-pointedness will not come. I cannot have a hundred worldly projects running and 101 will be realized God. It won't work. Those have to be put aside. Put aside means the formula Swami Vivekananda gives neither seek nor avoid. Life will present you with plenty of things to do. Don't worry, your days will be occupied. I, I, and uh, as it is, even without adding to things, you will, not, uh, uh, you will still keep running out of time. I remember seeing this uh, cartoon. I mentioned it. And the Father Time. There's a cartoon. Uh, father time and next to it is mother not enough time. <laughs> the mother is running around with kids and lots of um, uh, chores to do and things like that. So mother not enough time. <laughs> so uh, the world will present you with plenty of things to do. Your life will be overfull. So don't worry that what will I do if I give up all these things. Uh, so peace. Giving up those worldly pursuits, the result is of one type only, that is peace. That peace and the focus on spirituality, yeah, they are one and the same. Another point, Swami, this is a point that Swami Ram Sukhdas Ji uh, made in his book on the Gita, commentary on the Gita. I haven't found it elsewhere, but it's a very subtle and interesting point, so I'll put it before you. He says, contrast it with Jnana Yoga, what preceded earlier. In Jnana Yoga, knowledge is primary. One must intuitively grasp that I am the Atman. Once that clarity comes, that Atman you will see inside and outside. In every experience, it's the same Atman. Same awareness, same consciousness, same being. We read that. 
uh, in the 16th verse of the bhagavad gita nasato vidyate bhava if you remember that that isness everywhere it's there so in every experience we'll recognize that and the serenity of mind the focus of mind the concentration will come after that automatically it will come in gyana yoga he says in karma yoga bhakti yoga and raja yoga the process is reversed first a peace of mind and concentration must come then only enlightenment will will follow after that so bhakti yoga starts with this vyavasaya atmika buddhi let me repeat again the contrast between the two approaches in karma yoga bhakti yoga and raja yoga which is going to speak about now it starts with a clearing of the decks i want to give up all other pursuits and pursue pursue spirituality one pointed clarity and conviction it starts with this then only spiritual progress is possible this is the normal way to approach it but there is a direct approach which was talked about first there instead of talking about these things sri krishna pointed out the nature of the absolute if one can grasp it one is fortunate among the fortunate few who can grasp this then this one pointedness follows by itself you see it's like this i look at the necklace and the bangle and the ring and if i have understood what is gold then whatever i see i'll see gold when i see the necklace i'll see gold when i see the bangle i'll see gold when i see the ring i will see gold one pointedness one pointedness has come instead of multiplicity i'm seeing the one though i'm seeing all the all the ornaments do you remember the the uh, uh, example of the ornaments and gold the enlightened person in whatever experience men women children um, good and bad um, in um, youth and old age in success and failure it is the same existence consciousness place with different names and forms so one pointedness stability automatically comes there once that is grasped but it's very difficult to grasp it to begin with so the other way is spiritual practice having known that theoretically now we get into um spiritual practice proper so it starts with karma yoga and so we have a sai atmika buddhi this one pointed clarity and conviction is this distinction did it make sense i'm not found it anywhere but it's a subtle but important point which um ram sukhdas ji points out another place i think it was swami I forget one of the direct disciples maybe saradanand ji or somebody who writes there are actually two broad spiritual paths one is the path of gyana yoga the path of knowledge the other one is the path of action devotion meditation karma yoga bhakti yoga and raja yoga if you look at it from a metal sense if you step back and see the uh, the approach there are these two approaches one depends upon effort it's a graded progress step by step you go that is karma yoga bhakti yoga raj yoga the other one is a direct cutting through to the reality yes Yes. Can get that. Yes. So my point is that the other three paths are for those of us who don't have that pure mind. So it can Yes. We we are not we are not already saints that's what I mean. So we are we are moving towards that. For for us all these practices. In fact the rest of the Gita are is spiritual life. What is spiritual life? How do I live uh, and how do I practice spirituality all of that. but we must make allowance for that rare few who are like that it is a possibility such people are there and we all have to go to that point yes yes isn't bhakti the, as direct as it gets uh, uh isn't bhakti bhakti yoga extremely direct um yes but remember the framework that we are taking here is is in a very broad sense advaita vedanta non dual vedanta so there bhakti is sort of uh, you know knowledge is privileged above devotion because in this framework what what they will say bhakti towards god devotion a love and surrender towards god 
will ultimately lead you to that realization also. Because God will give you that knowledge. Whatever is needed, God will add on to you. But that's still a little indirect. Because you're taking from the individual to God to the absolute. And um, the Jnana Yoga is to the absolute directly. You are Brahman. But that's all in the paradigm of, of uh, Jnana Yoga. If you're coming from the paradigm of Bhakti, then Bhakti is obviously the most direct path. There is a devotional paradigm where God exists, I exist and my relation to God is one of devotion and surrender. That's it. Story is finished. But Advaita Vedanta says there is something beyond that. Beyond God and the individual, Jiva and Ishvara, there is the absolute Brahman. And real freedom is realizing your identity with the absolute. I am Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. Then what is the role of devotion in that? That's what we are coming to. Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Raja Yoga are all helps, secondary means to the attainment of knowledge. This commentator which he said that until you practice these things, that knowledge which I taught, in, uh, taught you earlier, that knowledge will remain paroksha jnana, secondary knowledge, indirect knowledge. It becomes direct knowledge with the practice of these things. Do you see uh, the two different paradigms? One must, it's complicated, but one must be big enough to see different paradigms. The spiritual life is vast. See what's written there just above you. Truth is one, sages call it variously. We're all talking about the same thing, but one may look at it from a knowledge perspective. One may look at it from a purely devotional perspective. In our order, we look at it from knowledge and devotion. Sri Ramakrishna, I was just reading, Swami Turiyanandaji says, in this age, Sri Ramakrishna primarily taught Jnana Mishra Bhakti. Devotion with knowledge. Knowledge and devotion. But there are paths of pure devotion. And as there are paths of pure knowledge. If I were t talking about the path of pure knowledge, I would have stopped at 37th or, or, or the, uh, before starting this, this, uh, all of this. You are Brahman, realize that. What's your problem? <laughs> <laughs> and there are teachers who do that. There are teachers who do that. The so-called direct path teachers, there are some, especially in this country. Uh, naturally, uh, United States people are uh, uh, impatient. Realization, here and now. So there are the teachers who teach the direct path. And it's, it's uh, very attractive because of two reasons. One, it says, one is, it seems instant now. Second, it seems effortless. Nothing, just I have to realize it. I have to know it. Knowing it doesn't seem so difficult. There's a catch there, but... But the problem with that is, often you will notice the teachings of these direct path teachers. I will not take some names. Some of them are actually genuine. Many of them are not. They don't know what they're talking about. But some, because it's easy to talk. But some of them are genuine. Even the ones who are genuine, in many cases you will find they have themselves pursued this graded path for a long time. Some form of meditation, some form of devotion, some form, many different practices. They have been inquiring for years and years and years. Then they make a breakthrough. And then they say, oh, it's so clear and direct. Let me teach that. But what they're making a mistake is, to, for them to come to this understanding, it's so clear and direct and evident, they had to go through a lot. And which, if the other person in front of you has not gone through that, they will just look at you with a blank expression. When, they, when you say, it's here, right now, don't you see it? Huh? What? It's like we can only kill the garden schools and there's, there's the other schools and only teach university. Yes. So a graded approach is good. I was reading Swami Turiyananda, why I'm saying Turiyananda, his birthday is day after tomorrow. So, look at the difference. We'll identify easily with it. He talks, he says, when Swami Vivekananda would say, I, he identified with the consciousness in everybody. He did not, the words he uses is, he did not identify with the Upadhi. Upadhi means body-mind. I as consciousness in everybody. And then Swami Turiyananda ji, who is himself a great non-dualist, but he says, that does not come so naturally to us. So I like this. 
that I surrender everything to God. In Bengali he said, That doesn't come so easily to us. So for us, <coughs> I surrender to, to God, everything to God. Though he's a great Vedanti, non-dualist. Then somebody asked him the question, so for a devotee, if somebody who loves God, a dualistic approach, is it good to study these non-dualistic texts? He asked this question. And I have been asked this question. I was very interested to see what Swami Turiyananda said. And you know what he said? He said, for the devotee who continuously surrenders everything to God and says, thou alone, not me. What difference is, between that, is there between that and Advaita? What difference is Where is the difference between that and Advaita and, and non-duality? And then he goes on to say, Sri Ramakrishna used to say, tie the knowledge of Advaita to the hem of your cloth and then do whatever you like. Whatever you like means you can take the, the devotee's path also. You can take the path of service. You can remain immersed in meditation. Whatever you like. You can be dynamic and active. You can be drawn to a cave and sit in serene meditation. You can be an ecstatic devotee. You can be a combination of all of these which Vivekananda himself was. All right, let's go on. Before we go on, before the actual teaching of karma yoga, the other kind of karma which we are used to, Sri Krishna is pointing out the danger in that, the problem in what we are doing right now. Now the karma that we are doing has two aspects. One of which is we are very familiar with, the worldly karma. The work that we do in family and community and career. All of that, whatever we are doing, what we call work. That is karma. In Sanskrit, laukika karma. Day-to-day -day activities, our, our daily activities. But there was another, there's another kind of karma. Uh, which is vaidika karma. The religious work. That's also work. So in Krishna, Sri Krishna's time, people, ordinary people in the world, they did both kinds of work. One is the daily duties of life. Also, religious rites. In those days, it meant Vedic sacrifices. These days, we do puja. We go to temples and do puja and all of that. In those days, it was the fire sacrifices prescribed by the Vedas. All of this work, whether this worldly or otherworldly, whether secular or religious, all of this work, Sri Krishna classifies as ordinary karma. Sakama karma. Are, the one connecting feature of them is that they are prompted by worldly desire. This worldly desire, otherworldly desire. In this world, I want money and pleasure and power and fame, therefore I work. And in the other world, I want to go to heaven and have a good time. Therefore I work. Work means I do the religious rituals. Now the next three verses are about those religious rituals but they equally apply to our worldly activities also. And this is not something he's recommending. He is condemning them. He is saying these are not spiritual. Let alone the worldly activities prompted by desire but also the, the Vedika, the religious activities prompted by desire. They are religious but not spiritual. So look at the three tiers he has established. Worldly, worldly religious and spiritual. We have to read 42, 43 and 44 together. Yamimam pushpitam vacham Yamimam pushpitam vacham Pravadantya vipaschitaha Pravadantya vipaschitaha Vedavada Rataf Partha Vedavada Rataf Partha Nanya Dasti Tivadina Nanya Dasti Tivadina Kamatmana Swarga Para Kamatmana Swarga Para Janma Karma Phala Pradam Janma Karma Phala Pradam Kriya Vishesha Bahulam, Kriya Vishesha Bahulam, Bhogaishwarya Gatim Prati, Bhogaishwarya Gratim Prati, Bhogaishwarya Prasaktanam, Bhogaishwarya Prasaktanam, Taya Aparita Chetasam, Taya Aparita Chetasam, 
ವ್ಯವಸಾಯಾತ್ಮಿಕ ಬುದ್ಧಿ ವ್ಯವಸಾಯಾತ್ಮಿಕ ಬುದ್ಧಿ ಸಮಾಧೌ ನ ವಿಧೀಯತೆ ಸಮಾಧೌ ವಿಧೀಯತೆ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಸೇ ನಾವು ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಲೈನ್ ವ್ಯವಸಾಯಾತ್ಮಿಕ ಬುದ್ಧಿ ಸಮಾಧೌ ನ ವಿಧೀಯತೆ ಇಸ್ ದ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ that vyavasayatmika buddhi one pointed clarity and conviction about spiritual life is essential for spiritual life for, for spiritual practice that is not possible if somebody is involved in such things what are such things he talks about one side only the vedic rituals the religious rituals but also it includes the worldly activities what are they yami mam pushpitam vacham pravadanti avipaschita the unwise talking about the flowery language of the vedas which tell you such and such heavens are waiting for to to be attained please perform these rituals and give me give the priest his commission uh, and then after death the the merit you have earned by religious activity will take you to heaven every religion has this at one time the i think the catholic church is to sell indulgences that is one that is one of the things that i think uh, martin luther protested against um so i have committed a lot of sins suppose and i'm going to die i'm afraid of going to hell now can i give a donation to the church and the church will write me a letter saying that will give him a pass on this <laughs> so every religion has this kind of thing that um, after death whether i deserve it or not i'm going to have a wonderful time there'll be a heaven where there is no suffering no hunger and thirst all pleasures are instantaneously fulfilled and so in hinduism also you have not one heaven multiple heavens depending on your uh, credit worthiness <laughs> how much uh, merit you have ac- accumulated you go get to go to different heavens we had a wonderful swami um swami nishreya shanand ji who established the vedanta work in south africa many decades ago he came to usa also he visited um he i never met him but i've heard about him from senior monks and devotees so he was a remarkable person by all accounts he was a disciple of swami shivananda a great vedanta non dualist but also a great yogi uh, who actually had who did hatha yoga is rare in in among the monks of our order and who had attained certain even siddhis some spiritual powers uh, and so on great scholar and an extraordinary teacher so as you will see from this example he gives he gave an example to explain this kind of uh, teaching of the vedas remember the vedas have two parts broadly speaking karma kanda and gyana kanda gyana kanda is vedanta gyana kanda means the portion dealing with spiritual knowledge the portion dealing with spiritual knowledge that's the culmination the final teachings of the vedas that is spirituality and that is found in the texts called the upanishads but apart from that the vast bulk of the vedas they contain teachings about religious rituals most of which are not practiced anymore by hindus modern hindus have replaced those by modern rituals called pujas but the ancient vedic rituals they were meant for the same old things i'll give you um the exact the exact quotations from the vedas there are such promises as vrishti kama yajeta the those if you desire rainfall sacrifice sacrifice unto the gods if you desire putra kama yajeta if you desire a child especially a male child in those days yes they were very patriarchal and misogynistic uh, but sacrifice unto the gods um then swarga kama yajeta if you desire heaven after death sacrifice unto the gods and so on and the and the sacrifices were of various types depending upon your um, income range there's something to suit <laughs> your capacity and have to take whatever you have got <laughs> so you make your place in heaven swami nishreya shan ji gives an example of that um, he this beautiful example to to explain that see you earn this merit depending on your good works your religious rituals and uh, meritorious works and you go to heaven but whatever is earned by work is limited so it's not endless heaven after a long long period of time your merit will be exhausted your credit cards will be maxed out and then you'll be tossed out of heaven 
You go back, you get back, go back to earth, your older karma takes hold of you. And you are born again in some um, family and, and you carry on with your um, spiritual evolution. But you have a, what is it called, furlough. <laughs> like a break in heaven. And multiple heavens. And it's all subject to an end. It comes to an end. So the example is this. Swami Nishreshanji, he said, it's like when I come from South Africa to India. I book a ticket uh, from Johannesburg to Mumbai. And it takes money. So I have to collect the money for the ticket and I book the ticket. And then when I get into the aeroplane, there is the air hostess who says, come, come, this is your seat. Now he's actually literally translating from the Vedas. Um, it, the, the description is like this. After death, the, after giving up the body, the soul, the sukshma sharira, the, the jivatman, is greeted by heavenly messengers who say, Ehi, ehi, uh, eshava, uh, sukritaha, sukrita silokaha. I forgot the exact term. This is the meritorious world. This is the world you have earned by your merit. Come, come and enjoy. So the aerostis says, come, come, here is your seat. And then I strap myself into the seat and you go high and high, high. 30,000 feet, the, the uh, captain says, we are flying at 30,000 feet. And uh, then there is this wonderful food and uh, there, there is a movie to be seen. And so it's so nice. And by the time you're getting used to it, and they said, I could live like this. This is very nice. The captain makes the announcement, we're descending into Mumbai. The temperature outside is 100 degrees in the shade and 100% humidity. And you say, no, no, I want to stay here. Well, I, I, we hope you'll fly with Air India again. And <laughs> <laughs> Back to Earth. Now, this is the Vedic conception of heaven. Nothing spiritual about it. That, that particular, it's a kind of otherworldly pleasure. And so he says, the ones who get enticed by the flowery words promised in the Vedas. You might ask, Vedas are religious texts, why would they do this? In fact, there are two, this religion has these two aspects. A religion where it serves our needs in this world and the next. I want to be happy here. I want to be wealthy here. I want to be healthy. I want my children to, be, to do well. Can God and religion help me? Most people use religion for this purpose. And that's what the Vedas also said. You want health, you want prosperity, do these things. So a moral, sustainable kind of life which make, gives you worldly happiness, but strictly limited. It will all come to an end. There's no other way. And it also promises you other worldly happiness. A refined version of worldly happiness. That also comes to an end. It's only when one graduates out of kindergarten, religious kindergarten, and says, how many times do I have to go through this? Why go through this? You may say, I don't remember any of it. It would be nice if I remembered going to heaven and all of that. You do, not as memory, but as some scar, as tendency. The reason why you are here today and I am here today. This is not a very pretty picture for any of us. We want the truth. Who am I? What is the meaning of all of this? Is there any permanent solution to the, to the uh, cycle of life, uh, life and death? We are searching for nirvana, moksha, enlightenment, freedom. So when you graduate to this uh, higher class, then the Upanishads come and say, they condemn this, what Krishna is doing. So that is not for you. We have got something better for you. So worldly karma or otherworldly karma is to be replaced by karma yoga. And Sri Krishna is setting the stage for that. Why did the Vedas say it? Vedas know that we want enjoyment. We will do it in an immoral way to stop that. That's destructive for us and for everybody else. So the Vedas prescribe a moral, sustainable way. Not just Vedas, every religion does that. You want money, you want pleasure, you want power, nothing wrong with it at all. But stay within the limits of truth and self-control. Earn money only what you have earned. Things like that. All religions do it. Our urge for worldly enjoyment, the religions seem to support it. But only uh, because we want it. 
And once we graduate from it, then they will show us the real thing, which is God realization, enlightenment, nirvana, whatever you call it. Nanya dasti iti vadina. These uh, propounders of the Vedic ritualism, they say that there is nothing else. There is this world which you are living in, and after that, there is that world. Okay, that sounds great, but just a minute. After that, after that, there is this world again. <laughs> and then the next world again. Okay, then I don't want this. I'll do whatever I want. Then there is the other world for you, that other place for you. <laughs> and in Hinduism, there's not one hell, there are multiple hells, but only there's no eternal hell. And they are basically all uh, what the results of our own naughtiness, basically. <laughs> So the Vedas say, if you want worldly existence and other worldly existence, then do it in a moral way, in an ethical way, in a sustainable way. But truly wise if you are, you will go beyond this. Kamatmana Swargapara, those who are desirous of heaven. Kamatmana, full of desires in this world and the next world. Janma Karma Phalapradam, they engage in this worldly activities, secular activities and religious activities, which... The activities are karma, secular and religious. Phala. Phala means result. The result will be this life and the next life you will get the results. Janma means birth after birth. Birth and death cycle will continue. Propelled. The fuel is karma. Karma is nothing but cause and effect. Causality. Kriya vishesha bahulam. And there is a whole range. It is a supermarket of Vedic rituals. What do you want? Everything is available. Uh, and th this is all for bhoga aishwarya gatim prati for enjoyment aishwarya glory and enjoyment power glory wealth and you say this sounds great why not be careful <laughs> there's another kind you know who say can't I have both yeah I like it Swami what you're talking about enlightenment nirvana I want that but this also is great right I can, can I have both of them no, no are and no they are fundamentally contradictory this is I want to remain as a separate individual and I want to go from enjoyment to enjoy party hopping from one party to another party to another party I want my life to be one long party so that that's the model the paradigm I'm working with and this is something very different I give all that up to enjoy peace and bliss in the company of God, if you are a devotee, or in the realization of who we really are, the, the witness self, the pure consciousness, the absolute. So they, are, they, they two do not go together. One is within karma, one is beyond karma. Yes. So I have a question. There are four Vedas. Yes. And all the Upanishads are... Scattered Vedas. in the four Vedas, yes. So if I got what you just said, Yes, each Veda has a Karma Kanda, ritualistic portion, and a Jnana Kanda, a, a knowledge portion. And they are contradictory, contradictory in, in one, only in one sense. The later portion repudiates the earlier portion. If you ask, why should it be so? As I just explained, it's because we want it. If the Vedas had their way, they would take us straight to spirituality. The Buddha tried that. Have you noticed? The Buddha's teaching was centrally about moksha, about nirvana. It became a heavily monastic religion. But ultimately the result was not good for India. When thousands and thousands of people were not really cut out for the ultimate spiritual goal, not cut out for monastic life, it became a prestigious thing to be a Buddhist monk or a nun. And they gave up their worldly life and they all went to the monasteries. Society collapsed. And the monasteries, their, the quality there went down. All sorts of uh, malpractices entered into monastic life. Anyway, yes. No, I think even in the Brihandakaya Upanishad, yes. there are portions of that Upanishads that have rituals. That are Absolutely. All the, the bigger Upanishads, they also have rituals. Uh, but they just show that ritual as a upasana, as a spiritual, preparatory spiritual practice, not for attaining worldly goals, but for uh, for pure, it'll, it'll make it clear if you have worldly goals then this or other worldly goals then this very ritual will give you those goals but you will not get spirituality 
If you want spirituality, then this very ritual will give you purity of mind. See, there somebody asked, this karma yoga, is it uh, Krishna's invention? No, it is actually there in the Upanishads. These rituals, which are supposed to be part of karma kanda, they are also found in the Vedas, in Kata Upanishad, in the Upanishads. In Kata Upanishad, there is a ritual, which is taught by Yama to Nachiketa. It's a kind of a Vedic fire sacrifice. No details are given there. Now, what the Upanishad wants to say is, if you want heaven, heavenly existence, you can use this ritual, collect enough credit, merit, and after death you go to heaven. But you will not be spiritual. You will not get enlightenment. But if you want enlightenment, then this same ritual will help you uh, to get pu purification of mind. You should not want the worldly or otherworldly results then. So the same work, you see the root of karma yoga is there. The same action can make you worldly if your goal is worldly. The same action can set you free from action, can make you spiritual if your goal is spiritual. That's the, the seed of karma yoga right there. Of course Krishna will give a much more developed teaching here. Yes, one, one has to be clear there. See, in many cases, when you say explicit need is not there, but we generally have the need, I'll tell you, it's like this. Let things go well for me. Let things go well for everybody. And often there's an element of fear involved. If I don't do it, will something bad happen to me? That is a, that is a clear indicator that I have a, a, some amount of worldliness left in me. I am doing it for God-realization. God will be pleased with me. My, my beloved Lord will be pleased with this worship. That is karma yoga. Whether it is worship or doing my daily duties. Look at Arjuna. He enters into this battle for worldly reasons. I want the kingdom. I want to take revenge on the evildoers. That's selfish actually. All uh, justifiable but selfish, worldly. Now Krishna is saying, do the same thing as an offering to God. You have put me this is my, in this situation. This is my duty. I shall do it. What do I want? I want God. I don't want this. It will come of its own accord. It did. The Pandavas won the battle. They got the kingdom. All of that came. But no longer was it for that purpose anymore. So it, again, karma becomes karma yoga. Kriya vishesha bahulam. So many rituals uh, will be prescribed. If you, even nowadays, if you go to a Hindu temple, the priest will have a whole menu of rituals for you to perform. You should look at the price list before you go. <laughs> yes, you had a question? <coughs> Yes. But to some extent, even in the second part, you want it for yourself. Like, if you did all those practices, but some, your neighbor would become spiritually enlightened as a result of that, it won't be that appealing to you. That is true. And uh, your question basically is Is desire for God also not a desire? Are you giving up all desires when you, when you say, I want God? Literally, I want God is a desire. So, Sri Ramakrishna gave the answer to that. He said, Desire for God is not to be counted among other desires. Why? Because it roots out all other desires. Notice, the desire for God is not a desire. If you put it in non-dualistic terms, it becomes even more clear. I want to realize my own true nature, Atman, which is the Atman of everybody. Then I become identified with everybody. If you actually look at the life of such a person, usually the life of such a person will be one continuous self-sacrifice. Does not want anything for oneself. So the person is transformed into a saint. It would be very different from everybody else. Now what made this person, him or her, become like this? That I don't want these worldly pursuits. I want to realize who I am. You might say even that is for yourself. It is true. But then that self will be the capital S. Not an individual self cut off from everybody else. If Notice... How if one person becomes a saint, an enlightened person, everybody else actually benefits immediately. Everybody surrounding that person, everybody in society, even the presence of such saints is a blessing to society. 
So it's not that they gain by themselves. Uh, it is uh, everybody gains with the presence of such people. Yeah. And they identify with everybody. They don't feel that, ah, now I'm enlightened and you are fools. <laughs> no, they feel most ordinary. They, they feel that I am not. God alone is. That individual identity, either in devotion or in knowledge, the individual identity is submerged. What is the harm in uh, pursuing uh, worldly pleasure and success? Bhogaishwarya prasaktanam taya aparhita chetasam Vyavasayatmika buddhi samadhauna vidhiyate Those whose minds are swept away Aparhita means robbed, stolen Swept away by this overwhelming desire for pleasure For worldly success Their minds will never stabilize on God That one-pointed clarity, conviction will not come It will keep getting swept away It will keep getting swept away you see, now you understand what is a monastic life basically. It's just a formalization of what is being taught here. The dress, the codes, the behavior. We are told, do not mix with worldly people. Those whose goals are worldly, do not mix with them. Why not? Are they bad people? No. It's simply that if, if those desires, those things again are rekindled within you. They are already there within us rekindled within you, you will again be swept away from your spiritual conviction and you will be swept back into the worldly path. I know. I remember there is a number of such examples. A monk, I remember, he was a doctor before he became a monk. But he was uh, uh, what is called an MBBS. Uh, do we have such a degree in uh, USA? In, in, what would be the equivalent in? MD. MD. No, but in India also you have an MD which is above yeah, MBB. Above yeah. So this monk, a very nice Swami, he's, he's much more senior to me. One day I, I, he was posted to the our hospital. The hospital run by the monks in Calcutta. We have a big hospital. And one day I heard he had left. He had uh, left the order, monastic order. What happened? Now... An MBBS is actually a lower degree. An MD is a higher degree. Now when he's there, as a monk, he's also working and uh, serving the patients and everything, and he sees the other doctors. Now there are these other doctors who are well-known doctors, who are famous doctors, who are really rich, and they have flourishing practices. And the others, it's a hospital after all, so other people are in awe of them. And this poor monk is working there, and he's with them, and again, after some time, a desire grew to in his mind, I should also be an MD. So he gave up the monastic life and he said, what is he doing? He enrolled in the MD course for, for being an MD. You see how it gets uh, covered over again. A monastic aspiration, suddenly a worldly aspiration again uh, is uh, rekindled. Yeah, if you put, so you have to be very careful where you put, put it in. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna talked about the fence. Um, a new sapling, it needs to be fenced in because he says otherwise the goats and cows will come and eat it. But he says when it becomes a huge banyan tree, he says the fence is not required and in fact you can tie an elephant to it, nothing will happen to it. So when we begin our spiritual life, protect it. Protect this aspiration. I've seen it again and again. I know this uh, couple in, in California who were... Uh, now they are they are really rich, really successful and spiritual. And uh, they, they were telling me about their plans, how they will spend their time in meditation and all. And in between they went for a cruise. And they came back and all the time, all the plans changed. Why? Because on the cruise they met, they met these people who were richer than them, more successful than them. And they thought that maybe we want one more mansion and the, and the latest luxury car and this and that. The desire of uh, awakened. You may, we may laugh at it, but when it is, the desire comes and it is possible. I know I have the capacity, I know I have the money, maybe a little more effort, a few more years of working, a few more investments, and I can get that mansion. Then it takes possession of you. It's like a ghost. 
you're you're bewitched possessed by a ghost and what will happen is 5 10 years of your life will go away again before one swings back again to the uh, to the uh, uh, this is how spiritual evolution goes but one can shorten this torturous process make a vyavasaya atmika buddhi very important this one take away from this class is it's a lifetime's decision to make i define myself as a spiritual seeker you need not change anything externally the external changes will come slowly over time but make up your mind from now on i am a spiritual seeker whenever it comes you reaffirm this it's not something that you have done today and that's it every day is a reaffirmation that i am a spiritual seeker god is my very own my purpose in life is enlightenment yes i want to be happy and peaceful and blissful the way i will do it is through spirituality that is the wisest way of doing it i will not measure my success and failure in worldly terms anymore let it happen don't measure your achievements in worldly terms anymore your friends and relatives who are on that path they will go along that path and they will have uh, they'll have worldly achievements accomplishments very good be happy for them no regrets once you take this path we have already seen some of that that's enough the wise man the wise person sees a little bit and understands the rest of worldly life is like this one person a devotee in detroit he said to me you know swami uh, this realization i've come to this um that uh, there's no end to this what i'm doing he's he's in the corporate ladder in, in his very big multinational american company he said there's still a higher position to achieve there is uh, if you have a boat you now you want a, 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 your own aeroplane and then things like that is more and more and more there's no end to it so this is that saying you know if you, even if you win the rat race you are a rat <laughs> really make up your mind very clearly once you do it it's not very difficult at all what's done is done i have learned my lesson from that and uh, my purpose now is god realization it's not very difficult it's not even asking you to make a huge change in fact arjuna wanted to make a huge change i want to give this all up and I become a monk krishna says no 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 wait a minute you stay right where you are keep doing right what you do and i'll show you how right here you can become enlightened so that's the whole grand topic of karma yoga the teaching has not yet started but like a good teacher he says he is building up the base what is the need for the teaching we realize this today the need for karma yoga is that one pointed clarity conviction it won't come it won't be stable unless we do karma yoga It'll, we'll see what what is to be done if i'm not going to pursue worldly goals then what am i going to pursue what am i going to do with my time and energy he'll tell you and uh, if i don't do that what's the harm so two things krishna has said in the um 41st verse he said what is the purpose of this and the 42nd 43rd and 44th if you don't do it if you remain engaged in worldly and other worldly activities as we are right now what is the harm that's what he pointed out Om Shanti 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 Hari Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu See even this thing we chant Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu we offer this at the um, at the feet of Shri Ram Krishna This is the karma yoga actually We did all of this and for what purpose for the, so that the lord is pleased and that's that's the philosophy of work